There is so much to say. I have so much to say. Look, this is part three of the video series in which I read aloud my translation of Beyond Good and Evil, Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future by Nietzsche in German, Jenseits von Gut und Böse, Vorspiel an der Philosophie der Zukunft by Friedrich Nietzsche. And I'm gonna be reading for you paragraph 11 until paragraph 23 of my translation. This is my English translation of the German original. My name is Joseph Sulia, S-U-G-L-I-A. And there is so much to talk about. Before I recite my translation, I wanna make a few comments, just so that you have a context in which to understand the text. So just a few remarks, just a few remarks. So when Nietzsche writes of the honeymoon of German philosophy, he is mocking Hegel's speculative Good Friday. It's a parody of Hegel's speculative Good Friday. That's the first thing. Secondly, one of Nietzsche's criticisms of the speculative idealists in German philosophy, such as Schelling and Hegel, is that they pander to the godly. They pander to the religious. They pander to the pious, whereas Nietzsche does not. Nietzsche is a reprobate thinker. Okay, now, I wanna talk about Nietzsche's critique of Kant. So Kant asks in the Critique of Pure Reason, the first critique, Die Kritik der Reinen Vernunft, how are synthetic a priori judgments possible? Okay, I don't have time to go into Kant too deeply, but let me just say this, that first of all, a priori means before the fact. That is to say, before the possibility of human experience. Not merely independently of human experience, but before all human experience, right? There are certain forms in our mind, certain thoughts that we have that could not possibly have been derived from human experience because they are universal and they are necessary. These truths are applicable in every single context, independently of every context, regardless of space or time. Okay, fine. A synthetic proposition, a synthetic statement, is a statement in which the predicate is not contained in the subject. Okay, fine. So we have certain synthetic a priori judgments in our mind prior to the possibility of experience, fine. Where do these judgments come from? Kant is asking. In a nutshell, Kant's answer to his own question is they are made possible by a possibility. Or as I translate it, they are capacitated by a capacity. In other words, synthetic a priori judgments are made possible by the transcendental imagination the synthetic power of the transcendental imagination, according to Kant. But here's the problem. Kant's answer to his own question is a non-answer. It's a tautology. Kant isn't saying anything. He's simply repeating himself. Kant's answer is a redundancy. Again, it's tautologous, right? Now, at this point, Nietzsche refers to Moliere, in, in particular, Moliere's play, The Imaginary Invalid, which is about a hypochondriac. And in Moliere's play, The Imaginary Invalid, a physician explains that the soporific property of opium is a virtus dormitiva, a dormitive virtue. So in other words, opium puts people to sleep by putting people to sleep. So, so the physician in Moliere's great comedy is simply saying that opium is a soporific which has dormitive values, which means that it puts people to sleep. He's just saying the same thing over and over again. He's begging the question. So, so the ta this tautologous non-response of the physician is resemblant to Kant's tautologous non-response to his own question. Synthetic a priori judgments are capacitated by a capacity, to paraphrase, right? So Kant isn't giving us an answer. This is Nietzsche's critique of Kant, but also in a way, it's kind of a farce, it's a lampoon. Nietzsche tells us that 
such answers belong in comedy. But this is philosophy. This is unintentional comedy. It's accidental comedy. So it is high time, according to Nietzsche, to replace Kant's epistemological question, how are synthetic a priori judgments possible, right? With another question, who cares? What are the value, what is the value of such judgments for life? So synthetic a priori judgments, do they even exist? Nietzsche doesn't think that they exist. But why is it necessary to believe in them then? What is the evolutionary benefit of such judgments? Do they enhance life? Do they promote life? Do they intensify life? And if they do not, why do we care about them? This is Nietzsche's critique. It's his question. Perhaps it is necessary for human beings to lie to themselves in order for humankind to perdure, in order for humankind to survive. We as a human species perhaps need to deceive ourselves in order for the human species to survive. Perhaps it is necessary for humanity to believe in such lies in order for humanity to evolve, to grow. Could it be that randomized natural selection demands self-deceptions, camouflages, subterfuges, simulations, chicanery, mendacity, fakery, chicanery, lies? This is Nietzsche's implicit question. Perhaps humankind needs lies in order to propagate itself, to proliferate itself, to perpetuate itself. This means, this doesn't mean that such questions are true. This means that such questions might still be false. That is to say, they're mangled. They're questions that are apparatic. Apparatic questions are questions that are nonsensical. They're based on false premises. Perhaps it is necessary to believe that synthetic a priori judgments are possible in order for humankind to flourish, however. Nietzsche's critique is really quite brilliant. So something else I want to talk about. So according to Nietzsche, this is implicit in his argument. He, he doesn't say this, he doesn't write this as expressly, explicitly. As soon as you say or write something about your feelings or sensations, the feeling or the sensation dies. All language lies. Every word is a lie. But even this may not be said, for if all language is false, then there is something else which is true. You see? Perhaps what Nietzsche is doing here is universalizing falsehood and thereby superseding the distinction between the true and the false. This is a problem that I have with Nietzsche. It's a kind of paradox. At best, it's a paradox. Whether or not it's paradoxical remains to be discussed. I will discuss this in another video. But if you read Nietzsche's late notebooks or his early essay, Über Wahrheit und Lüge im außermoralischen Sinne, on truth and lying in an extra moral sense, you will find the assertion to paraphrase that truth is a lie. But what does that mean? Because if you say something like this, aren't you assuming that your own statement is apodictically true, right? If I say truth is a lie, am I not assuming that my statement is true? It's a little bit like the paradox of Megara, right? Everyone in the city of Megara is a liar. But if a Megaran uh, leaves the city and goes to Athens and says, I am lying, I am a liar, is he or she telling the truth? It's the paradox of Megara. Anyway, anyway. Is this a paradoxical statement or is it a cone? what the Buddhists call a cone, which is um, a statement that has no signified content, but is meant to prompt, to provoke enlightenment. It doesn't make sense from a logical point of view, but it provokes enlightenment and awakenedness, right? Wakefulness. It provokes thought. And is Nietzsche aware that such a statement is paradoxical? Okay, next, 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 I wanna go quickly. Nietzsche is slighting, again and again, his former unofficial teacher, Schopenhauer. So the beginning of the end of the love affair between Schopenhauer and Nietzsche took place when Nietzsche thought very deeply about Schopenhauer's so-called metaphysical need. Also, it could be translated as the metaphysical requirement. That's like the need for human beings to believe in another world, the emotional need 
according to Schopenhauer, this putative need that human beings have to believe in another world, a world beyond the so-called world of the senses. But for Nietzsche, the world of the senses is the only, is the only um, world that there is. It's the only objective world. And even if there is another world, the possibility could scarcely be denied. We don't know anything about it. It's just the photographic negative of the world in which we're living, right? But anyway, so Nietzsche contests this idea that human beings have a metaphysical need, that they have this, this necessity, this necessary feeling to believe in the beyond, the epikina, as the Greeks would call it, the beyond this world. What is beyond the this world, the here and now? No, 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 Nietzsche says, no, we, we, human beings have just been inculcated with this false belief. This false belief has been introjected into the minds of human beings for centuries, for millennia even. That's why human beings today believe in it. Anyway, there's no metaphysical need for Nietzsche, according to Nietzsche. So, so Nietzsche makes this counter argument in the notebooks that were collated into Human, All Too Human, A Book for Free Spirits, Schopenhauer's so-called metaphysical need, the so-called metaphysical requirement, is the alleged emotional necessity, again, the alleged emotional necessity for human beings to believe in a world beyond this world, in a permanent structure, an eternal structure outside of the maelstrom, the whirlwind of appearances. But guess what? There is nothing outside of the maelstrom of appearances. This is all we have, friends. This chaos of appearances, right? Anyway, so the official topic of this book is the moral biases of philosophers. But as you will see, and as we proceed, this book deals with sundry topics, multiple topics, a multitude of different subjects. It is not a unified or coherent book. The meaning of this book is not reducible to one thing. Even this chapter, which is supposed to concern the moralisms of philosophers, does not merely concern the moralisms of philosophers. This is the only thing I agree with Jordan Peterson on. Jordan Peterson uh, said in a video, which I haven't watched, but I know he says this. This is not a book. Beyond Good and Evil is not a book. I agree with him. Beyond Good and Evil, the full title is Beyond Good and Evil, prelude to a philosophy of the future is not a book if by a book we mean the codex, right? A unified, organized totality with coordinating parts. It's not. Anyway, I want to move quickly. So the Platonists and the Stoics have this in common, according to Nietzsche. They both enjoy mastering their senses because their sensuality is so powerful, right? That's why they're, that's why they're ascetic, right? They're ascetic because they have such strong feelings, such strong desires. So the Stoics and the Platonists practice abstention from pleasure because they experience pleasure so powerfully and because they experience pleasure in self-overcoming. This is an underestimated pleasure, isn't it? There's a kind of pleasure that comes from mastering the pleasures, right? From abstaining from pleasures. They are thwarted the Stoics and the Platonists, according to Nietzsche, they are thwarted, self-stultified, self-stultified, self-repressed hedonists. Maybe they're even eudaemonists. This reminds me of what T.S. Eliot writes in, in an essay called um, Tradition and the Individual Talent. Only those with strong personalities understand the necessity of depersonalizing their poetry, to paraphrase. Okay, I want to move on. I want to move on. So Nietzsche is savagely, ferociously dismantling philosophical concepts, one after the other, such as immediate certainty. There's no such thing. That's, that's what you would call in rhetoric antiphrasis, which is worse than an oxymoron. So an oxymoron is something like um, cold fire or sick health. That's, that's from... Um, the most lamentable and excellent tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. Anyway, no, 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 antiphrasis is much worse. In antiphrasis, you have two concepts that just clash. They don't make any sense, right? It's like saying a, a local pandemic. Well, pandemic mean, you know, pan means nature, it means everywhere. So a pandemic doesn't recognize any geographical or national boundary, right? So it makes no sense to call 
a disease, a local pandemic. Anyway, so, so here are some examples of antiphrasis uh, that Nietzsche adduces. Immediate certainty, absolute knowledge, the thing in itself, disinterested judgment, the cause in itself. These make no sense. First of all, how could something be immediately certain? No, in order to declare or identify something as certain, it has to go through the medium of human judgment, right? So that's, that's nonsense. That's a nonsensical concept. Absolute, no, absolute knowledge, which you can find in Hegel, for example. No, knowledge is not absolute. Knowledge by definition, that is to say by its essence, is relative. There's no such thing as absolute knowledge because what is absolute is, abso is absolved of all exceptions, all relationships, all qualifications, um, all exceptions, as I think I said that, all exemptions, right? No, what is absolute is what it is. So there could be no such thing as absolute knowledge, right? Because knowledge is a form, again, of mediation. Anyway, the thing in itself, no, there is no such thing as a thing in itself. Disinterested judgment, this is my favorite because how could any judgment be anything other than interested? If you're judging someone or you're judging something, you're interested in that person or in that thing. So, so Nietzsche reveals all of these nonsensical concepts as self-contradictory. Certainty is mediated, again. Someone has to serve as the mediator or the mediatrix in order to establish so-called certainty. Knowledge by definition, again, is relative to a human subject, right? And to the perceptions of a human subject and the feelings and the biases of a human subject. Okay, things do not exist in themselves independently of relation, right? Think about it. Meaning only exists in relation. Meaning is relation, right? There are no things, there are, there are only relations between things. There are no things, there are only relations between things. And one of these relations might be the relationship to a human consciousness. So one should finally release oneself from the seduction of words. The films of Jean-Luc Godard suggest a similar distrust of language. Anyway, let me pause for just a second. Even the proposition, I think, contains a superabundance of problematical presuppositions. So a genuine thinker will not take the proposition, I think, for granted. And perhaps that thinker will not even call oneself a thinker, much less a philosopher. Nietzsche implies this. So this is what Nietzsche is suggesting. By the way, all of this is, this is I, I'm just commenting on the text. What right do we have to assume that there is such a thing as a self-contained, uncontaminated subject that produces thoughts? No, I do not think. Thoughts surface, appear, bubble up in my mind, and I have no idea where they come from. Who is to say that I am the cause of my thoughts? Why do, why do I have the subject hypothesis added to my thinking? So I might only be aware of my thinking. Why do I assume that I think? Isn't that a prejudice? Isn't that an inherited prejudice, right? And let us pretend that we know what thinking means. We do not, we do not, for the purposes of, for the purposes of argument. Let's just pretend we know what thinking means. What right do we have to say that there is something like a stable, self-sufficient, self-contained, uncontaminated subject that is the agent, the cause of thoughts? I don't know what I'm going to be thinking, saying, or doing next, right? I could be thinking of wild pigs. I could be thinking of wild boars. Why am I thinking of wild pigs? I don't know. I don't know. These thoughts bubble up from the unconscious mind. Anyway, I wanna move quickly. Why do I believe in cause and effect? Well, it's a prejudice. It's an inherited prejudice that I have, right? I believe in cause and effect because I have been trained to believe in cause and effect. My mind has been brainwashed. I have been programmed to believe in causality. That doesn't mean that causality, causality exists. And I think that Nietzsche is getting this from Hume anyway. So the window shatters, and I assume that I know why the window shattered, but do I? So maybe I see a, bo uh, a young boy with a baseball bat, and I say that the young boy with a baseball bat 
is the cause of the shattering of the window. But how do I know? How do I, how do I think the so-called effect into the so-called cause, right? How do I join the so-called effect to the so-called cause? Is this that exists somewhere objectively in the world? Are there causes and effects in the world? No, there are not. That is my mind playing a trick on itself. It is leisure demand. It is prestigitation that links a so-called effect to a so-called cause. Now, am I saying that things don't cause other things? No. But what I am saying is that the mind synthesizes the so-called cause to a so-called effect. Causes and effects do not exist in the world. They are the synthetic causality, causation, is the synthetic activity of the intellect. Anyway, I am going to keep on talking until I drop from fatigue. Okay, look, so these are all word games. It is a linguistic superstition to assume that every form of activity must be preceded by an actor. This is basically Nietzsche's critique of the self. There is no such thing as the self, a changeless center of consciousness. There's no such thing. The I exists, but it is just a word, a representation. You don't have a self and neither do I. The way that I am speaking to the camera now is much different from the way in which I would speak to a family member or a friend, a cashier at a convenience store, the person who, who trims my hedges, the person who carries my mail, the door dasher who delivers Chinese food to my door. I, I talk to each of these people differently than I am addressing you, which is to say there are many selves, if one must use that word, right? If one must use the word self at all. Every human being is a multiplicity of selves, and one self is dormant when another self is active. And depending on the context in which I find myself, one self will be activated and then the others will vanish. Now, the, way, the analogy that I would use is that of a magic eight ball. Those of you who are from generation X or older will know what a magic eight ball is. Um, I would Google search that if you don't know what it is, but basically it's this ball, you shake it up and then you see a number or you see a word or you see a letter. Well, consciousness is like a magic eight ball. The other selves disappear when one self is activated. Again, if we must use the word self. There are other ways of criticizing the concept of selfhood, though. When you are working out, you know, you're exercising, you're jogging, you're riding a horse, are you aware of yourself? While you are exercising or dancing or listening to music or riding a horse, I do not exercise, dance, or listen to music it exercises, dances, or listens to music. I do not write my books. The books are writing themselves, right? Most of all intellectual activity is unconscious. And Freud takes off from there. Yet there are even other, there are yet other critiques of the concept of the self. When people discuss the self, they are assuming the existence of a changeless center of consciousness. Where is the center revealed in functional magnetic resonance imaging? It's not. If you subject yourself to fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, you will not see a self. I might be aware of food in the supermarket. I might be aware of my neighbors. I might be aware of trees. I might be aware of birds, dogs, the rain. But then if I direct my consciousness to myself, why am I not a phenomenon in the way in which they are phenomena? Tell me that. So whatever comes into the open field of consciousness within the horizons of consciousness is a phenomenon. That is to say, it is an appearance, right? Self-consciousness is fictionalization, is self-deception. Okay, I want to move on to another topic now. Okay, just to be clear, Sam Harris is not the first person to refute free will theory, voluntarism. Spinoza and Hume did so before uh, Nietzsche even. 
but Nietzsche's refutation of voluntarism is the most devastating and coherent counter-argument to the theory of the freedom of the will. Anyway, also I want to talk about something else. Karl Popper, who of course, this was after Nietzsche, but Karl Popper developed two interesting concepts in his career. And one of them is called unfalsifiability, die Unfalsifizierbarkeit. You could also translate that, I suppose, as irrefragibility, irrefutability. So an argument is strong if it is falsifiable, not if it is unfalsifiable. And I know this seems counterintuitive. Hear me out. So a strong argument is an argument that could be proven false. Isn't that interesting? Under certain conditions. So if you come across an argument that someone sets forth and there is no way of disproving it, then it must be discounted out of hand. So if someone asserts the existence of a purple pegasus, right? A giant winged horse that is snorting and beating its hooves on the asphalt and beating its wings uselessly and does not defend this allegation and does not show you any evidence and merely says, you will just have to take my word for it. There is a purple, a giant purple pegasus outside beating its hooves on the pavement, beating its wings uselessly. You know, you just have to um, take my word for it, right? Well, the auditor has every right to repudiate, to reject that claim, for it is, it is unsubstantiated, first of all. But the real point is that it is unfalsifiable, right? Now, a stick figure drawing of a purple pegasus or a photoshopped image of a purple pegasus is not sufficient evidence of the existence of the purple pegasus. A painting of a purple pegasus is a weak argument because the evidence is faulty, but at least it is an argument, even though there are holes in the document, right? There are holes in the document. It is a stronger argument than an unfalsifiable claim that the purple pegasus exists, and you're just gonna have to believe me. At least the person who provides evidence in the form of an image in the form of a line drawing of a purple pegasus is making an argument as dubious and as weak as that argument is. To assert, so here's the point, to assert the existence of the purple pegasus without evidence is to opine, right? To give an opinion, to give an unfalsifiable and hence rejectable opinion. It is not the making of an argument. Okay, and that's implicit in this text as well. Schopenhauer, to get back to Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer presents the hypothesis, the intuition, that only the will is self-evident. The only thing we really know for certain is what Schopenhauer calls the will. The will to life, right? The life will, according to Schopenhauer. This is an unfalsifiable claim. You, you, you understand why I was talking about Karl Popper now, I hope. So only the will is known to us, according to Schopenhauer. The will for Schopenhauer is vitality. The vital force of nature that pulses, that throbs, that palpitates within us and keeps the human species going. It keeps life going. The will is blind. It is insistent. It is vigorous. It is not just non-intellectual. It is pre-intellectual. That is to say it comes before the intellect, right? So the will, again, is the life will for Schopenhauer. The will that drives forward the reproduction of the human species. However, however, the will is not precisely identical to the libido. Although the late Nietzsche and Freud seem to make that identification, the libido is merely a form in which the will manifests itself. Okay, anyway. Now to return to the official subject of this book, the moralistic biases of philosophers. This book officially is about the moralisms of philosophers, but again, it exceeds that restricted focus hundreds of times. Anyway, let's talk about this. So traditional philosophy, according to Nietzsche, is the philosophy of the crowd and evinces the uncritically accepted assumptions of the crowd. So where do professors of philosophy come from? Well, they come from the crowd. Philosophers come from the crowd. They're not apart from the crowd. They are a 
part of the crowd. Get it? Okay. Let's talk about Nietzsche again. Okay, look, for Nietzsche, the will is complex. The will is complex. The will is multiple. Now, it should not be merely presented as the will, as Schopenhauer does, as if it were something simple and self-explanatory. No, this reminds me of the concept of love, right? The word love connotes a multiplicity of meanings. The love of a child for one's parent, the love of a parent for one's child, the love of a priest or a rabbi or, or an imam for one's congregation, the love of God, romantic love. These are all many different modes of loving the love of humanity, the love of animals, the love of the planet, whatever planet one happens to be on at that moment, the love of art, the love of literature, the love of music called melophilia. But isn't it interesting that one word, love, verbally unifies all of these different denotations. One word means all of those different things. Here's another question. Is the concept of the free will a fetish? <laughs> is it a fetish? Is it something that we want to believe in because it gives us pleasure? Think about it. Don't we want to be the captains of the ships of our minds? Don't we want to be the motorists of the automobiles of our bodies, right? We're the drivers of the cars of our bodies. Do we want to believe that we have authority over our bodies and over our minds? Do we want to believe that we are in command of our so-called selves, in control of ourselves? Doesn't such a belief, which is a false belief, by the way, give us pleasure? There is no such thing as the freedom of the will, but perhaps it is a fetish to believe in the freedom of the will. Perhaps voluntarism, belief in the freedom of the will, is a fetishistic belief. Consider that. So to get back to something I was talking about earlier, that's derived, inspired by Nietzsche. This is not Nietzsche, this is myself. Every human being is 1,001 people, right? Every human being is a plurality, a multiplicity, a congeries of subjectivities, of souls, of selves, if one must use these words. Every human being is a society of selves. If you talk to your parents, you are one person. When you talk to your neighbor, you become a different person. When you talk to your eldest child, you are a different person. When you speak to your younger child, you are a different person. Okay, consider that, consider that. All right, let me now talk about concepts. Concepts are not spontaneously or autogenously produced, right? Every concept belongs to a system. And passages such as the passage that inspired my commentary demonstrate that Jacques Derrida is not original, that he is not as innovative as his ovine acolytes assume that he is. The point here is that meaning does not occur in isolation. Again, meaning is relation, relativity, relationality. This idea did not come from Saussure, whom Derrida more directly plagiarizes. It certainly doesn't come from Derrida. It comes from Nietzsche. Derrida took this idea. I'll, I'll be polite. Derrida took this idea from Nietzsche. All right, another topic. Anyone who divides the world into a suprasensible part and a sensible part is thinking metaphysically. Don't divide the world into the world beyond the senses and the world of the senses. That's, that's metaphysical thinking. Anyway, Nietzsche makes the exciting suggestion that grammatical systems make possible metaphysical systems, right? Because we think in a grammatical language, we believe that every action has a subject. This is metaphysics. This is metaphysics. But language conditions our thought. I say this all the time. It's not as if we have ideas and then we, we grope for the right word to express our ideas. No, we have words first and ideas come afterward. 
ideas are secondary to thoughts. What would it take for us to stop thinking metaphysically? What would it take for us to stop thinking metaphysically? Would we have to invent a language? Would we have to invent a language? In other words, I mean, invent means to create something new. So perhaps we need a new language. How interesting is it that there are some languages that are subjectless, non-subjectified language? Japanese is only one of many such null subject languages. There are many, there are many. You can Google search this. There are many, many different null subject languages, non-subjectified subjectless languages. I'm gonna pause for just a moment. There's something else very interesting that I want to talk about. Another way of superseding the grammatical subject, in particular the human subject, there is something that isn't talked about very often or written about very often. Everyone talks about the active voice and the passive voice. You know, the active voice is she throws the ball. The passive voice is the ball is being thrown by her. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows that. But when was the last time that you heard someone talk about the middle voice? Let's talk about the middle voice. What is the middle voice? Well, first of all, the middle voice suppresses agency. It suppresses subjectivity. The middle voice is much like the passive voice, except there is no form of the verb to be. And this is how I would put it. This is not derived from any source. This is just my own interpretation. But I would say that the middle voice is like the passive voice, except the object acts like a subject. <laughs> I, have a, I have an example. An example of the middle voice would be this. The cheese sells for one dollar per pound. Where is the subject of the sentence? There is none. I mean, the object is the cheese, but the cheese is acting like a subject because the cheese is selling itself, right? You get it? Okay. Incidentally, Heidegger Heidegger writes about the middle voice in Sein und Zeit's Being in Time. So Nietzsche writes about the statement, it lightnings es blitzt in On the Genealogy of Morality, a polemic. I have a whole, I have three videos. I have three videos dedicated to On the Genealogy of Morality, On the Genealogy of Morals, a polemic. Um, yeah, look them up, watch them. They're some of my best videos. But who is doing the lightning, right? Who is doing the lightninging, right? That's actually in English, by the way. Lightning can be a verb in English. It's not, it's seldom used. But anyway, where is the subject? Who is doing the snowing or the raining, to use more familiar English language examples? In the statements, it is snowing, it is raining, it is freezing. There is a pure process, a pure doing without a doer a pure asubjective activity. Why do, we, why do we impose? Why do we impose a subject upon every process? Why do we super add to a subject? Why do we super add a subject to every procedure? Why do we do that? By the way, if you're interested, I wrote a whole essay on this subject. It's my essay on the tragedy of Macbeth by Shakespeare. I don't know if there's another Macbeth. Um, so there are traces of East Asian thought of Hinduism in Schopenhauer and in Nietzsche. And I suspect that Nietzsche got his dose of Hinduism from Schopenhauer. The Hindu, do the Hindu, Hindu doctrine, I would say, the Hindu doctrine of samsara can be found transmuted in Nietzsche's doctrine of the eternal recurrence of the same. Die ewige Wiedekehr des Gleichen. Now, I haven't created this video yet, but I'm going to be creating a video on the eternal return, the eternal recurrence of the same, and I'll make that available. Okay, let's go back to the freedom of the will. Okay, the idea of the freedom of the will is the idea that we are self-created agents. It is the idea that we are gods, basically, right? And as gods, we are self-responsible, free, autonomous, self-directed. And if you believe in the free will, and Sam Harris does not go into this in his 2002 book, no, his 2012 book, Free Will, you believe that you could rip yourself out of temporality and spatiality, 
like a god, as if you were a god, without a personal history, without any kind of evolutionary history, without any connection to the history of the species to which you belong. Now, I'm going to criticize Sam Harris yet again because he deserves it. Let me talk about Sam Harris. All right, Sam Harris, let's talk about Sam Harris. Well, Sam Harris, who pretends that he is the first person to ever refute free will theory, does not acknowledge Nietzsche once in his book on the free will, in Harris's book on the free will. Even though Harris studied philosophy as an undergraduate at Stanford University, and even though Harris's first unpublished novel, apparently, included Nietzsche as a character, and even though Harris recommends a few English translations of Nietzsche on his website. So why is that? Well, uh, I once admired Sam Harris. I once admired Sam Harris. But Sam Harris ceased being interesting almost immediately after he published his book, Free Will, in 2012. I consider this book to be excellent, and it has a permanent place in my library. Though the fact that the text never refers once to other thinkers' refutations of voluntarism is troubling, very troubling to me, not just Nietzsche's refutation of voluntarism, but Spinoza's, Hume's, Kant's partial uh, refutation. It's a partial refutation. Schopenhauer's partial refutation of free will at all. It has been profoundly disheartening. It's profoundly disheartening to me to watch sh such a sharp, bright mind atrophy over the past eight years. Sam Harris is now a Twitter philosopher. That is to say he is now a non-philosopher or a philosophaster. His blitheness toward Aristotle is absolutely astounding to me. This is something that Harris said during one of his recent Ask Me Anythings. Well, Aristotle is great and all, but he has done great damage to the history of science. Excuse me? Is Harris unaware that there would be no science without the categories that Aristotle developed? And in his conversation with Douglas Murray, who has proven himself to be far more intellectually agile than Harris, uh, Harris said, did Schopenhauer write religion a dialogue before or after he threw his housekeeper down the stairs? Now this tabloid rumor appears to be all that Harris knows of Schopenhauer or cares about Schopenhauer. It's all that interests, uh, it's all that interests Sam Harris is this rumor that Schopenhauer threw his housekeeper down the stairs. I mean, it's an interesting rumor, but is that all that, is that all that Sam Harris cares about Schopenhauer? Uh, I did benefit, I did benefit from listening to Sam Harris and his critique of the concept of subjectivity. When he came to Chicago theater, when he came to the Chicago theater circa 2018, but he was only recapitulating things that he had said circa 2011. Name me one single insightful or new thing that Sam Harris has said since 2013. Anyone who discusses the economics of podcasting while on a podcast loses my respect as a philosopher. He talks about online conservative commentators many whom are not worthy of speech, more often than he talks about philosophy. Instead of discussing ideas, he discusses individual human beings. Sam Harris does. This would be fine if he discussed individual human beings from an intellectual point of view, but he does not. He no longer does so. You might find my words severe, but I am being, to use a Sam Harris phrase, intellectually honest. No genuine philosopher would ever sell a telephonic application. And I doubt that a guru would endorse a telephonic application on meditation, of all things. All right, let's go back to Nietzsche. 
Nietzsche could have taken a hard line on determinism and had written, you apostles of the free will, you are all wrong. Determinism is the way to go. One should follow a thoroughgoing mechanistic determinism and reject the so-called freedom of the will. But notice what Nietzsche does instead. As I said in the previous video, video two, this is video three, Nietzsche lets no one off the hook. Nietzsche lets no one off the hook. Nietzsche is vigorously and rigorously criticizing the determinists as well. So he doesn't just criticize the voluntarists, those who believe in the free will, he also criticizes the determinists. Anyone who believes in the unfree will is operating from a place of pathos and is exhibiting as much pathos as the advocates of free will. And this is too much pathos for Nietzsche. There is neither a free will nor an unfree will. And those of you who want to disabuse yourselves of the freedom of the will, if those of you who want to disabuse yourselves of the illusion of the freedom of the will, while retaining the illusion of the unfree will are also wrong. The unfree will is also a kind of mythology. All right. Nietzsche wants no followers. Now Nietzsche's alter ego is Zarathustra. So Zarathustra, the alter ego of Nietzsche, encourages apostasy. He wants to apostatize his apostles. Zarathustra wants to apostatize his apostles. Only by betraying me are you loyal to me, to paraphrase the text, right? Nietzsche is suggesting through the mask of Zarathustra, the piety of treason when it comes to his followers. Again, Nietzsche wants no followers. All right, let's talk about Nietzsche's theory of life, right? Nietzsche's theory of life is the doctrine of the will to power. The doctrine of the will to power basically is a doctrine, it's a theory of natural selfishness. The will to power basically means natural selfishness, right? So Nietzsche's theory of life is not an ontology, as Heidegger writes, is that all of life is bound up with relativities of power. Every organism, including the human organism, wants power. And what that means is every human organism wants power over all other organisms. Every human being strives for total domination. Now, everything could be explained by reference to the language of power relations. Now, people such as Jordan Peterson and Douglas Murray criticize this idea as being too monistic, though Peterson is criticizing Foucault, not Nietzsche. It's bizarre. Peterson apparently is unaware that Foucault's theory of power relations canalizes the ideas of Nietzsche. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. Peterson believes that life is about accountability and competence, not power. I doubt that Peterson has read very much of Nietzsche at all. He always gets Nietzsche wrong. Peterson does. There is no such thing as accountability or responsibility, according to Nietzsche. And Peterson seems to think of himself as Nietzsche's precursor. This is mystifying to me. I don't know where Peterson got that from. I mean, Nietzsche and Peterson are antipodal, are antipodal. They're at antipodes. They are antipodal, I think is how you pronounce that. So according to Nietzsche, the illusion of responsibility is a manifestation, is an instantiation of the will to power. And we are supposed to believe that competence has nothing to do with power. So I would like to conclude by saying that the idea of life as the will to power is not as simple as Peterson and his followers seem to think that it is. And again, they don't even know that this comes from Nietzsche. It's bizarre. All right. Something that Nietzsche also suggests, and this kind of makes him beyond philosophy in a way, he's like a meta philosopher, is that the personality of the philosopher always reveals itself. It comes on stage unwittingly, right? 
Philosophers who subscribe to the idea of the unfreedom of the will do so for purely psychological reasons. They want to free themselves from the feelings of guilt and regret, shame, self-resentment, self-accusation, self-recrimination. So philosophers might have this feeling of guilt. As human beings, they have this feeling of guilt and they want to free themselves from the feeling of guilt. And how do they do so? They subscribe to the erroneous concept of the unfreedom of the will. And those who want to believe that they are responsible for what they do believe in the, in the freedom of the will, which is also false. They want to, oh, so, so, so those, those who believe in the unfreedom of the will want to overcome some misstep in their past, which is understandable. And the voluntarists, those who believe in the freedom of the will, think of themselves as their own demiurges. They are the technicians of the machinery of themselves, right? This is nonsense. This is nonsense, but the opposite is nonsense too. The determinists want to answer for nothing and they demand out of a kind of self-contempt to unload their self-blame onto somebody else. The determinists pathologize criminality, etc. Anyway, how interesting is it to observe that Nietzsche does not even exempt himself from critique. So even he believes in a necessary and calculable course of the world, right? Anyone who believes that there is an intrinsic lawfulness of the world is interjecting one's own concept of lawfulness into the world, a concept that is, of course, inherited from culture. One is injecting, inserting, introducing human all, hum all too human concepts into nature. But life has neither laws nor organization. What about the laws of physics, right? These are descriptive rules, but they're not pre-inscribed rules. The concepts of legality, right? The concepts of law that natural law theorists find in nature, right? They put into nature themselves. To channel Heidegger, we find in a text only what we put into it. This is what Heidegger calls the hermeneutic, the hermeneutic circle, right? If we think that nature is benevolent, this is because we have the interpretive desire for nature to be benevolent, to be as charitable as possible. What if we were to claim that nature is innocent, right? What if we were to say that nature were innocent? The only word to precisely describe nature is indifferent, but even that word is probably problematical, right? Okay. So why is it a projective and introjective misinterpretation to call nature innocent? Because the concept of innocence implies the counter concept of guilt. Remember that all concepts are relational concepts, right? All concepts are relational concepts. The concept of good does not exist except in relation to the concept of evil, right? Good and evil form a doublet. Nature and culture, innocence and guilt form doublets, right? which is to say that they are inherited and they are inherited and uncritically accepted concepts, right? We have the tendency to anthropomorphize nature. We anthropomorphize nature when we call nature peaceful. We may not even call nature peaceful. And any tour guide who calls nature peaceful or designed to please the eye is anthropomorphizing nature, literally putting nature into the form of the human, right? This is fatuous folder all. It's fatuous folder all, right? Nature does not care about us. The world is not cruel, but neither is it kind. When a volcano explodes and douses people with magma, most people would say that this is not as quite, no, it's not quite as cruel as if an entire army were to slaughter the residents of a village, right? A volcano explodes an army massacres residents of a village, which is worse, most people would say when the army massacres the residents of a village. Think of the 1755 earthquake in Lisbon, Portugal, or the 1630 volcanic eruption in Furnas, Portugal. Are these tragedies? No, they are not tragedies, for tragedy implies spectacle. A tragedy is a spectacle. Who is a spectator? Is death a spectacle? Is death a spectacle? What is it even kind to call death a tragedy? A tragedy is a show, which is opposed to comedy. People who say that life is a comedy are just as naive 
as those who say that life is a tragedy. Even to say that life is a comedy is to falsify the world. And this is a flaw in Nietzsche because Nietzsche seems to say that life is a comedy. That's a flawed way of thinking. So Nietzsche is implying philosophy has been superficial for most of its history. Why? Because it has been contaminated by moralism and metaphysics. This has led to a mis it's led to a misrepresentation of life. It's led to a misrepresentation of the world. It's led to a misrepresentation of the human being. Hatred, jealousy, envy, greed. Nietzsche is suggesting that all of these so-called bad feelings are part of the economy of life. And they are needed. Hatred is necessary. Jealousy is necessary. Envy is necessary. Greed is necessary. Nietzsche is saying, this is not me not just for the human species to survive, but to grow, to proliferate, to enlarge itself. Such affects, with an A, are necessary for the expansion of life, not just for the sustenance and maintenance of life. Perhaps life is an abyss. Perhaps life has no foundation, no transcendent foundation. Nietzsche is sympathetic to those who do not want to think such a nightmarish thought. And yet let no one consider Nietzsche to be negative. Let no one consider Nietzsche to be nihilistic. He is a life affirming th thinker. Nietzsche is a life affirming, life celebrating thinker. Life is liberated and liberating. For whom does Nietzsche write his books? To whom does Nietzsche write? Nietzsche writes for readers who have not yet been born. They are what he calls the free spirits. Now Nietzsche throws a party for himself at the conclusion of part one of his book. Let's talk about that. All of the current ideas of psychology and philosophy are archaic and they're restraining, they're inhibiting. And Nietzsche wants to disinhibit us from moral cargo because it is freighting us, it is burdening us, it's weighing us down. The burden of inherited concepts is preventing us from looking at human beings in the eyes and saying, this is who we are, this is who I am. Without shying away from our so-called badness, right? Don't shy away from your so-called badness, your so-called evilness. The point is to develop an incorporative, integrative attitude toward our so-called badness, our culturally unacceptable impulses. This is what Nietzsche is suggesting. And Carl Jung, Carl Jung follows him. So if Carl Jung helped make Nietzsche the household appliance he is today, you know, Nietzsche is now a can opener, a sewing machine, a vacuum cleaner, perhaps we owe Jung a debt of gratitude. So instead of disavowing, repudiating, repressing these so-called negative affects, the negative dimensions of the human being, we should incorporate them, we should integrate them, and that would make for a more extraordinary philosophy and would make for more extraordinary human beings. For we would be more honest with ourselves about who we are. We are back and now I will read for you my English translation of Beyond Good and Evil, Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future. Starting with paragraph 11, I will conclude with paragraph 23. Paragraph 11, it strikes me that people are everywhere working hard to distract themselves from the real influence that Kant exerted over German philosophy and to slip away from acknowledgement of the worth that he placed upon himself. Kant was first and foremost proud of his table of categories. 
he said with his table in hand, this is the most difficult thing that could have been done in behalf of metaphysics. Let us understand this could have been. He was proud to have discovered within human beings a new capacity, a new faculty. The capacity of synthetic a priori judgments. Granted, he deceived himself therein. However, the development and sudden efflorescence of German philosophy is dependent on this pride and on the competitiveness of all younger philosophers who want, if possible, to discover something even more worthy of pride. And this means new capacities, new faculties. But let us think of it. Now is the time to do so. How are synthetic a priori judgments possible, Kant asked. And how did he answer, really? They are capacitated by a capacity. Unfortunately, his answer was not composed of four words. Rather, his answer was so extensive and deferential and given with such an extravagance of German ponderousness and flourishes that one missed the ludicrous niaiserie allemande that was embedded in such an answer. Niaiserie allemande means German foolishness, German silliness. One was out of one's brain at news of the discovery of this new capacity, and the jubilation reached its apogee as Kant discovered slash introduced a moral capacity too in human beings. For at that time, the Germans were still moral and not at all realistically political. That was the honeymoon of German philosophy all the young theologians of the Tübingen Seminary went looking in the bushes. All of them went searching for capacities. And what did they find in that innocent, rich, still young age of the German spirit, in which romanticism, that evil fairy, whispered, whistled, and sang an age in which finding and inventing had not yet been distinguished. Above all, they found a capacity for the supersensible, Schelling christened it intellectual intuition, and thus gratified the most ardent desires of his fundamentally piety-loving Germans. One cannot do greater damage to this exuberant and exalted movement than by taking it seriously and by not treating it with moral indignation. It is a movement that was youth itself, no matter how much it clad itself in gray and hoary concepts. Enough, one grows older, one grows older. The dream flies away. The time came when one scratched one's brow, one is still scratching it. One was a dreamer, first and above all, old Kant. Capacitated by a capacity? he said, or at least meant. But is that an answer, an explanation, or is it merely the repetition of the question? How does opium put to sleep? It capacitates by a capacity, namely by the virtus dormitiva. As that physician in Moliere put it, quia est in eo virtus dormitiva, cujus est natura sensus asupire. But such answers belong to comedy. And it is high time to replace the Kantian question, how are synthetic a priori judgments possible? With another question, why are such questions necessary? That is to say, it is time for us to understand that such questions are necessary to believe in for the preservation of the species to which we belong which means that such questions might still be false or more clearly stated and crude and basic. Synthetic a priori judgments should not be possible. They should not be possible. We have no right to them. In our mouths, they are purely false judgments. The belief in its truth is indeed merely necessary as a foreground belief and as visual evidence 
which belongs to the perspectival optics of light. And finally, to recall the monstrous effect which German philosophy, in quotes, I hope that I have the right to these quotation marks. I hope that it is understood. And finally, to recall the monstrous effect which German philosophy, in quotes, has had on Europe, a certain virtus normativa is needed, is involved. They were all delighted, the noble layabouts, the virtuous, the mystics, the artists, the three-quarter Christians and political obscurantists of all nations to have a counterpoison against the still prepotent sensualism of the time, which cascaded over from the previous century. In brief, sensus asupire. Paragraph 12. As far as materialistic atomism is concerned, this is one of the most well-refuted things in existence. And perhaps there is not a single scholar today so uneducated as to ascribe any serious significance to this term, except as a convenient, handy expression, namely as a shorthand, thanks of all to that Paul Bosovich, Boskovich, excuse me, who together with the Pole Copernicus, at this point the greatest and most victorious opponent of visual evidence, while it was precisely Copernicus who persuaded us to believe against all sensory evidence that the earth does not stand still, Boskovich taught us to abjure that last bit of belief in the earth standing still, namely belief in matter, in material in the earth residue and the little clump known as the atom. It was the greatest triumph over the senses that had ever been won on the earth. It is necessary to go further and to declare war on the atomistic need, which has had a dangerous afterlife in areas that no one suspected, just like the popular metaphysical need which has had a dangerous afterlife in areas that no one suspected, just like the, you know, just like the popular metaphysical need. Let this war be a merciless fight to the finish. Before all else, one must wreck that other fatal atomistics, the one that Christendom has taught the best and the longest, the atomistics of the soul. Let this phrase be allowed to characterize the belief that the soul is something unassailable, eternal, indivisible, that the soul is a monad, that the soul is something like an atom. This belief should be stricken from science. Between us, it is absolutely unnecessary to free oneself from belief in the soul and to renounce one of the oldest and deferential hypotheses, since the naturalists in their awkwardness lose the soul as soon as they touch it, but the path to new conceptions and refinements of the soul hypotheses stands open and concepts such as mortal soul and soul as subjective multiplicity and soul as social structure of drives and affects will continue to have their civil rights in science. By preparing the end of the superstition, which hitherto proliferated around the soul idea with a tropical luxury with a tropical luxuriance. The new psychologist thrusts himself or herself into a new wasteland and a new mistrust. It might be the case that the older psychologists had an easier and more amusing time. Ultimately, however, the new psychologist knows that he or she is condemned to invention. And who knows, perhaps to Discovery. Paragraph 13. The physiologists should think twice before, excuse me, the physiologists should think twice before positing the drive to self-preservation as the cardinal drive of organic beings. Above all else, a living entity wants to discharge strength. Life itself is the will to power. Self-preservation is only the indirect and most frequent consequence thereof. In short, here as everywhere else, be careful of superfluous teleological principles, such as the drive to self-preservation, 
thanks to Spinoza for this inconsequentiality so much is demanded by method, which is essentially the parsimony, the frugality of principles. Paragraph 14. It is dawn today in perhaps five or six heads, but even physics is merely an interpretation of the world and an arrangement of the world among us, if I may say so. But insofar as it, but insofar as it rests on belief in the senses, it counts for more and will continue to count for more. That is, it will count as an explanation. For a long time yet to come, it has eyes and fingers on its side. It has optical evidence and tactile evidence on its side. This has had an enchanting, persuasive, convincing effect on an epoch with a basically plebeian taste. Indeed, it instinctively follows the truth canon of the eternally popular sensualism. What is clear? What is explained? In quotes. Only to what can be seen and felt. That is as far as the problem is pursued. To the contrary, the enchantment of the Platonic perspective consists precisely in its resistance to sensible evidence. It was a dignified perspective. Perhaps the perspective of human beings who enjoyed even more powerful and fastidious senses than our contemporaries, but who found a greater triumph in mastering their senses, and this by means of pale, cold, gray, conceptual nets that they threw over the colorful chaos of the senses, over the mob of senses, as Plato put it. It was another kind of pleasure in world overpowering and world interpretation in the manner of Plato, different from the pleasure of physicists today, as well as the pleasure of the Darwinists and the anti-theologians who work in the field of physiology with the principle of the smallest possible force and the greatest possible stupidity. Where human beings have nothing more to see and grasp, there they have also nothing more to seek. That is, of course, another imperative than the Platonic imperative, which, however, for a sturdy, sedulous generation of machinists and bridge builders who have purely crude labor before them, it might be just the right imperative to get the job done. Paragraph 15. In order to pursue physiology, in order to pursue physiology with a good conscience, we must insist that the sense organs are not appearances in the sense that this word is used in idealistic philosophy. As such, they certainly cannot be causes. Sensualism, at least as a regulative hypothesis, if not as a heuristic principle. How is that? And others say that the external world would be the work of our organs. But then our body as a piece of this external world would be the work of our organs. And then indeed, our organs themselves would be the work of our organs. That is, so it appears to me, a fundamental reductio ad absurdum, given that the concept of causa sui is something fundamentally absurd. It follows that the external world is not the work of our organs. 16. There are forever innocuous self-observers who believe that there is such a thing as immediate certainty. For instance, I think, or as was Schopenhauer's superstition, I will. It is here and there as if knowing could purely and nakedly apprehend its object. In German, that's Gegenstand, Gegenstand. As if some thing in itself would never be falsified on the side of the subject or on the side of the object. In German, that's Objekt, Objekt. That immediate certainty or absolute knowledge or the thing in itself all contain a contradictio ad, ad let me say that again, a contradictio in adjecto, that means a contradiction in terms, is something that I will repeat 100 times. One should finally release oneself from the seduction of words. 
The people might believe that knowing is a knowing to the end. The philosopher should be saying, when I analyze the process that is expressed in the sentence, I think, I arrive at a series of bold assertions, the justification of which is difficult, perhaps even impossible. For instance, that I am the one who thinks, that there is even something that thinks at all, that thinking is an activity, and that the outcome of a being which might be thought of as a cause that an I exists. And finally, that what is characterized as thinking has already been settled, that I know in other words what thinking is. For if I had not already decided that what I experienced was thinking, how may I compare it with other states of mind? How may I say that what happened? How and how may I say that what happened to me wasn't willing or feeling instead? Enough. This I think presupposes that I am able to compare my present state of mind with other states of mind in order to establish what my current state of mind is because of this retrospective comparison with other kinds of knowing my current state of mind has absolute has absolutely no absolute certainty for me all right now back to nietzsche's language in place of that immediate certainty in quotes in which the people might believe in certain cases the philosopher takes on a series of metaphysical questions proper and genuine questions of the intellectual conscience, which are the following. Where do I get this concept of thinking from? Why do I believe in cause and effect? What gives me the right to speak of an I as a cause, and finally as the cause of thoughts, of thinking? Why? Whoever has the confidence to answer these metaphysical questions with an appeal to intuition, as a form of knowledge, as someone does who says, I think and know that this at least is true, real, certain, he will find a smile ready for him with two question marks from a philosopher. My dear sir, the philosopher will perhaps give him to understand. It is unlikely that you are mistaken, but why should it be the truth? Paragraph 17. As far as the superstitions of the logicians are concerned, I will never tire of underlining a single tiny fact that these superstitious ones are loath to admit. Namely, that a thought comes when it wants to come, not when I want it to come. Thus, it is a falsification of the state of affairs to say that the subject is the condition of the predicate, I think. No. Thus, it is a falsification of the state of affairs to say that the subject, I, is the condition of the predicate, think. It thinks. However, that this it should be the famous ancient I is putting it mildly, nothing more than an assumption, nothing more than an assertion and by no means an immediate certainty, in quotes, finally this it thinks is already too heavily determined. Even the it contains the interpretation of a process and does not belong to the process itself. People are deriving inferences from grammatical habits. Thinking is an activity. Every activity has an actor, therefore, The more ancient atomistics followed a similar schema that held that behind every force, there must be a clump of matter that motivates that force, namely an atom. More powerful minds learned how to do without that little piece of earth. And perhaps logicians too will learn how to do without that little it into which the eye so reverentially 
vanished. Paragraph 18. The smallest charm of a theory is not that it is refragible, right? Refutable. The refragibility, the refutability of a theory is precisely what draws discerning minds to it. The charm of free will theory is apparently owed to the fact that it has been refuted hundreds of times. Again and again, someone comes across this theory and feels strong enough to refute it once more. <laughs> 19. The philosophers take the effort to speak of the will as if it were the most familiar thing in the world. Indeed, Schopenhauer gives us to understand that only the will is actually known to us, completely known to us, without qualification or addition known to us. But again and again, it has struck me that in this case, Schopenhauer has only done what all philosophers have done. That is, he took over and exaggerated a prejudice of the people. Willing has always seemed to me to be something complicated, something that is only verbally unified, and that a single word willing contains a prejudice of the people that is overruled, even the smallest precautions that philosophers usually take. Were we more careful than we would be unphilosophical? We say in every willing there is a multiplicity of feelings. That is to say, the feeling of the state in which we are away, a feeling of the state in which we are toward, a feeling of this away and this toward itself, as well as the corresponding feeling in the muscles that comes into play by a sort of habit as soon as we will, even without putting our arms and legs into motion. In the same way that feelings, even a plurality of feelings, must be recognized as ingredients of the will. Secondly, so must thoughts be as well. In each act of the will, there is a commanding thought, and we should not believe that thought could be excised from willing as there were, as if there would be some willing left over after the thought were removed. No. Thirdly, the will is not merely a complex of feelings and thoughts, but above all, it includes an affect with an A. And it is that very affect of command. That which is named the freedom of the will is essentially the affect of superiority with respect to what must obey. I am free. That must obey. This consciousness is packed into every act of willing, particularly that intensity of intention, that proper look which fixates on one thing, that absolute evaluation, now you do this and nothing else matters. That inner certainty that one will be obeyed and everything else that belongs to the state and everything else belongs to the state of commanding. A person that wills, a person who wills commands something in oneself that obeys or that makes one believe that one is obeying. Now, the most remarkable thing about willing is that the people only have one word for so many things. We are in certain situations at once obeying. We are in certain situations at once the obeying and the commanding. And as the obeying, we know the feelings of compulsion, pushing, pressure, resistance, motion, that generally start right after the act of willing has begun. On the one hand, we are in the habit of neglecting and deceiving ourselves about this duality, thanks to the synthetic concept, the I. As the result of this synthetic concept, a whole chain of erroneous inferences and fallacious evaluations have attracted themselves, excuse me, have attached themselves to willing so much so that the person who wills believes in all good faith that willing is sufficient for action. So, since it is almost always the case that there is willing only where there is the expectation of the outcome of a command, only where there is the, the expectation of obedience, and therefore only where there is the expectation of action, appearance tends to translate into action. As if the outcome were necessary enough enough. The one who wills believes with a degree of certainty that action and appearance are somehow one and attributes the success 
the performance of the will to willing itself and consequently enjoys an increase in the feeling of power that all success brings with it. Freedom of the will. That is the name for the multitudinous pleasure state of the one who wills, who commands, and who equates oneself with the performance of this willing. As such, the one who wills enjoys the triumph over resistances while thinking that it was his will alone that overcame these resistances, or her will alone that overcame these resistances. Accordingly, the one who wills takes pleasure in being the commander, as well as pleasure in using the instruments that successfully carry the command out, the serviceable underwills, the subwills, or undersouls, or subsouls. Our body is indeed nothing more than a society of many souls. Okay, I didn't want to comment, but I just want to say here's another contradiction. This is another place in which Nietzsche's text contradicts itself. Remember what Nietzsche just said above about there being no society of souls or selves. Here's another contradiction. Anyway, I'm sorry. L'effet c'est moi. I am the effect. What happens here is what happens in every well-built, in every well-built and happy communality. The ruling class identifies with the successes of the communality. All willing is simply a matter of commanding and obeying and is built on the foundation, as I said earlier, of a society composed of many souls, in quotation marks. It is for this reason that philosophy arrogates the right to understand willing within the circle of morality. Morality understood as the doctrine of sovereign relations from which the phenomenon of life originates. Paragraph 20. Individual philosophical concepts are not self-willed and do not grow out of themselves, but only emerge in relation and connection to one another. As suddenly and as voluntarily as they seem to originate in the history of thinking, they belong to a system, as the comprehensive members of fauna belong to a part of the earth. This is ultimately revealed by the way in which diverse philosophers fill out a definite fundamental schema of possible philosophies. As if under a spell, they believe that they are carving out a new path, only to find themselves revolving in the same orbit. They might feel independent of one another with, with their critical or systematic wills, but something pushes them in the same determined order, one after the other, and this something is the same inherited systematicity and relatedness of concepts. In fact, their thinking is not so much a discovery as it is a recognition, a remembrance, a nostalgia, and a kind of homecoming to a remote primeval household of the soul from which such concepts developed. Philosophizing is the highest form of atavism. The familial relationships between Indian, Greek, and German philosophies are clearly perceptible, precisely where there is a linguistic relationship because of the common philosophy of grammar. I mean the common domination of, sim of similar grammatical functions. It is obvious that everything lies ready for a common unfolding and sequentializing of philosophical systems. On the other hand, the way to other possible interpretations of the world is as good as blocked. Philosophers of the Ural Altaic languages in which the concept of the subject is underdeveloped will see the world, in quotes, differently than those in Germanic and Islamic countries, the spell of grammatical functions in the final analysis is the spell of physiological judgments and of generational conditioning. So much for a repudiation of Locke's shallowness in his discussion of the origin of ideas. Paragraph 21, 
the causa sui is the best self-contradiction that has ever been conceived, a type of logical violation and a kind of unnaturalness. However, the exorbitant arrogance of humankind has entangled itself deeply and terribly in this nonsense. The longing for the freedom of the will in the superlative metaphysical sense that still lords over the heads of the semi-educated, the longing to carry total responsibility for one's actions and to disburden God, the world, one's ancestors, chance in society of all responsibility is the idea of being nothing less than the cause of sui oneself and with a boldness greater than that of little Munchausen to pull oneself up by one's own hair from the quag of existence. Suppose that someone saw through the Philistine simplicity of the popular free will concept and struck it out of one's head. I would then ask this person to take his or her enlightenment one step further and to rid himself or herself of its opposite as well. One should not reify the concepts of cause and effect as the natural scientists do and whoever else today thinks naturalistically, according to the dominant mechanistic idiocy, which would have a cause push and shove and effect into existence. We should only use cause and effect as pure concepts and not as conventional fictions for the purposes of description and clarification, but not for the purposes of explanation. There is nothing causal or necessary in the in itself no psychological on freedom. This does not follow from causality. There rules no such law. We alone are the causes. We have fabricated sequence the for one another relativity force number law ground purpose. And if we fashion and mingle this in itself into things, so we do so as we have always done, namely mythologically. The unfree will is mythology. Real life only concerns weak wills and strong wills. It is almost always symptomatic of what he or she lacks when a thinker feels out of compulsion, need, must follow, pressure, unfreedom in every causal nexus and psychological necessity. It is even treacherous to feel this way, and the personality of the thinker betrays itself, and in general, if I have observed things correctly. The unfreedom of the will is forever grasped as a problem by two opposing sides, but in a deeply personal manner. The one side would never dream of renouncing its responsibility, the voluntarists, right? They would not give up the belief in themselves at any price, for any price. They would not give up a personal right to their advantage. The vain cultures belong here. The vain generations belong here. By contrast, the other side wants to answer for nothing, to be indebted to nothing, to be guilty about nothing, and to demand from an inner self-contempt to be able to unload their self-blame onto something else. When they write books these days, this latter group tends to side with criminals. A kind of socialist pity is their most appealing disguise. And in fact, the fatalism of the weak-willed starts to look astonishingly attractive when it presents itself as la religion de la souffrance humaine. That is, it's good taste, in quotation marks. Forgive me, paragraph 22, forgive me as an old philologist for not being able to refrain from pointing my finger at bad tricks of interpretation, but that lawfulness of nature of which you physicians so proudly speak as if it only existed thanks to your explication an awful philology, in quotes. That is no factuality. That is no text. Rather, it is merely a naive humanitarian correction and a distortion of sense. One that comfortably accommodates the democratic instincts of the modern soul. 
Everywhere there is equality before the law. Nature is nothing different and no better than we are. An elegant thought in the back of the brain, one that disguises a plebeian enmity for the privileged and the autocratic, and one that disguises as well a second more refined atheism. Ni ju ni maitre, no God, no master. Neither God nor master. You want that too. And therefore, hooray for the laws of nature. Isn't that right? But as I said above, that is an interpretation, not the text and anyone else with an opposing intention and different tricks of interpretation could draw entirely different conclusions from the very same nature. And with regard to the very same phenomena could read out of nature, a tyrannous ruth, I'm sorry, could read out of nature a tyrannous ruthlessness and the merciless assertion of power claims. This second kind of interpreter would show the will to power without any exception or condition such that almost every word and even the very word tyranny would eventually appear as useless or as a weakening and mollifying metaphor as too human. And yet this same interpreter might nevertheless make the same claims about the world as you. Namely, that there is a necessary and calculable course of the world, but not because it is ruled by laws, but because the laws are absolutely absent and every power at every moment draws its final consequences. Granted, this too is an interpretation and you will doubtless be zealous enough to make this objection so much the better. Paragraph 23, all psychology unto this point has been dependent on moral prejudices and fears. It has never ventured into the depths. To grasp psychology as morphology and as the doctrine, let me read that again. Paragraph 23, all psychology unto this point has been dependent on moral prejudices and fears it has never ventured into the depths. To grasp psychology as morphology and as the doctrine of the development of the will to power, as I have done, no one has even touched on this subject, even in thought, to the extent, of course, that we are allowed to recognize in what has been written thus far, a symptom of that over which one has until now been silent. The violence of moral prejudices has permeated the spiritual world, supposedly, the coldest world, the world without presuppositions. And as is self-evident, a world that has been damaging, restricting, dazzling, and disfiguring. A genuine physio-psychology has to contend with the unconscious resistances in the heart of the researcher. It has the heart pitted against it. Even a doctrine of the mutual conditionality of the good and evil impulses and quotes as a more sophisticated immorality will cause grief and distress in even a robust and hardy conscience to say nothing of a doctrine that holds that the good impulses are derived from the bad ones. Just suppose that someone considers affects with an A such as hatred, envy, avarice, the addiction to power to be the life conditioning affects as states of mind that must be foundationally and essentially pre present and essentially present foundationally and essentially present in the total economy of life. And that consequently need to be intensified wherever life is intensified. Such a person will suffer from such a train of thought as if from a seasickness from vertigo. And even this hypothesis is hardly the most discomforting, hardly the strangest in this monstrous, nearly new realm of dangerous knowledge. And there are, in fact, hundreds of good reasons for someone to stay as far away from this realm as possible. On the other hand, if someone has embarked on a ship there too, ahoy! Clench your teeth right together. Open your eyes right now. Keep that hand firmly on the wheel. We will voyage together 
away from morality. We will squelch, we will pulverize every last remnant of morality as we embark and voyage. But who cares about us? Never before have such bold voyagers and of adventurers open this deeper world of insight. And the psychologist who sacrifices, it won't be a sacrificio del intelletto. It won't be a sacrifice of the intellect, that's for sure. Quite the opposite, the psychologist will demand, at the very least, that psychology will once again be recognized as the queen of all sciences, to whom all the other sciences give their service and readiness. For psychology is, from now on, the path to fundamental problems. One last comment, okay, when Nietzsche says psychology will raise itself to the queen of all sciences, he's uh, delivering a riposte to Kant in the critique of pure reason, the critique der Reidenvernunft, Kant says that philosophy is the queen of all sciences. Die Königin aller Wissenschaften. All right, I've been going on for a long time. I don't know for how long, but for a long time. This is the end of the third video in my 15 part video series in which I recite for your benefit, my English translation, Beyond Good and Evil, Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future in German, Jenseits von Gut und Böse Vorspiel, Eine Philosophie der Zukunft, by Friedrich Nietzsche. My name is Joseph Sulia, S-U-G-L-I-A. I look forward to seeing you in video four. Actually, I won't be seeing you at all, but you will be seeing me. Joseph Sulia here signing off and signing out. Goodbye.